Welcome back everyone to the next video in my Pillars of Eternity series. In the most recent uh, video we covered the race selections here in Pillars of Eternity and what race might be best for you depending on what you're going to play in the game and today we're going to be diving into the class selection for this game because there are much like there were some original races that you haven't seen in other fantasy RPGs and CRPGs, there are some unique classes to this game as well. Now, if you've never played Pillars of Eternity, it is a game that came out quite a few years ago by Obsidian Entertainment. It has a follow-up game uh, called Deadfire, which is also an amazing game. And if you love RPGs and CRPGs, I highly recommend that you play these games because um, it's a very unique take on a common fantasy theme but they're doing something different because they're not using like a Forgotten Realms setting or a traditional fantasy setting. They've done their own thing here. They've created their own world, their own unique lore. They've got all their own spells and everything else. It's super amazing. Um, can I say that? It's super amazing. It's a really fun game. I've played it a couple times in the PC. Um, it recently came to the Xbox Game Pass, and so I've been, uh, I just did a playthrough on the Xbox to try out the console version. I'm currently doing, as of February 2023, a playthrough of Deadfire as well, and I'm continuing to create content around the first game like these overview videos on the races, classes, lore, and beyond. So if you like that kind of stuff, do me a solid like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you never miss an update as we continue to do this and other games, because I also play a lot of other CRPGs, RPGs, MMORPGs, shooters. I do book reviews, TV reviews, pop culture. There's a lot of stuff here on YouTube, so check it out. More at the end on ways you could support beyond that. Uh, but in the meantime, let's dive into the class selection. So I'm just going to pick a human because that's going to give me the most range of kind of options because it's the most generic. So we'll just pick a uh, meadow folk version and then we're going to get into the classes. Now some of these you might be familiar with. So like the fighter, monk, druid, barbarian, paladin, priest, ranger, rogue, and wizard. You're probably going to be familiar with those. Now, they do have some slightly different variations here because, again, you're not going to have the feats that you would see in, say, um, feats or talents that you would see in Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder because they've done their own original system here. And I know a common critique... I'm not going to call it a complaint. It is a critique that some people have when they when they try Pillars of Eternity for the first time is that, oh my god, there's so much information. I don't know it because you know I'm used to Pathfinder or I'm used to Dungeons & Dragons or I'm used to Forgotten Realms. So I don't know enough about this world. It's an information overload. That's great. Take your time. There's a lot to see here. You're going to do multiple playthroughs. I've done four now. It's a great game to play through and the world is great and they're setting it up for more because they have another uh, they have the first person game that's coming out soon as well anyway let's dive into um the various classes here we start off with the let's just go down the list here barbarian brutes madmen berserkers those city-dwelling people often use the term barbarian with a dose of disrespect. These role warriors are respected by their communities for their ferocity and fearsome presence on the battlefield. Barbarians have a special, almost religious role in some cultures, but in many places, the undisciplined, fearless style of the barbarian is simply how warriors conduct themselves. They have a starting ability called Carnage, which allows them to hit with melee attacks and automatically make reduced damage attacks at all other enemies within a short distance of the target. You get a plus two to athletics, plus one to survival, and then we have some um, other additional stats. Endurance, health, accuracy, deflection at level one. Now, here's one of the first unique classes to Pillars of Eternity, the Chanter. In every culture across Aeora, there are Chanters. Many historians consider Chanters to be the most ancient workers of magic, their hallowed phrases stirring the collective memory of wayward souls around them, compelling them to, re to generate magical effects in a kind of reenactment. In some societies, Chanters form organized groups of storytellers and researchers, but in most parts of the world, they are just a time-honored part of local traditions. Essentially, a Chanter is a bard. Sort of. Kind of. It's a bard. Starting abilities, phrases, and chants. All chanters can continuously speak chants made up of magical phrases. Phrases produce passive effects and help build a chanter's power until they can use an invocation. Invocations are powerful magical effects that chanters can create after they have spoken a required number of phrases through their chants. Now, chanters spend most of their time in combat speaking chants, and they have really strange names like the wind that breaks over the wild wilderness or the flowers that 
go on the side of the river. So they will have these long phrases. And once they reach the end of the chant, they loop back to the beginning. Careful arrangement of phrases can produce a powerful sequence of passive effects. So um, it's really a unique way of doing the bard because it's not just singing a song. It's you're actually chanting during combat and they have different invocations that they can do. It's really cool. They get a bonus to lore and mechanics and then you can see some of their basic stats there. Cypher is another one that is unique to Pillars of Eternity. A recent discovery in the Eastern Reach, Cyphers were once called Brishalwin, or Mind Hunters by the Glanfathans. Cyphers have the ability to directly contact and manipulate another person's soul and psyche, using an ally's or enemy's essence as the focus for their magic. Though most ciphers are still found in the Eastern Reach, practitioners of the techniques have spread throughout the known world. They are gaining acceptance over time, but are generally distrusted, especially by the uneducated, and that's because of the uh, mythology around souls. Um, their starting ability is powers. They can directly target allies and enemies with powerful soul-focused effects. These powers cost focus, which ciphers build through the use of their soul whip. Here's their uh, bonuses to stealth lore mechanics and their stats. So ciphers are kind of like a caster. They're kind of like a magic user, but as opposed to doing elemental stuff, it's more about the mental abilities focusing the soul. So it's a very unique way of doing things. Next up is the druid, which if you've played a druid in other games, you're going to be familiar with it here. Animus at heart, druids tap into spiritual power that flows through the simple living things of Eora. Plants, animals, and sometimes even living stone. While not necessarily religious, druids do have a reverence for the natural world and a keen interest in understanding its mysteries. In most cultures, druids are understood as a sort of primal magician, but among the Glenfathans, the Nasatiki, Nasatiki, and many rural cultures, they have high positions of influence and authority. Now, they start off with the ability to shapeshift, the ability to have mastered one animalistic form, which gives you melee abilities and an additional power when you're shifted, but you can also focus on spellcraft, um, offensive and support-oriented spells. And then every two levels, druids automatically gain access to additional spell sets. Initially, these spells are limited by the number of times per rest, but as they gain power, your weaker, weaker spells eventually shift to per encounter use. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, you get a bonus to lore and survival, and there's your basic stat breakdown. If you've played a fighter in one place, you've played a fighter everywhere. They can either be sword and board, or you can have them be a, a dual wielder or two-handed weapon badass. Um, it's just a martial character. Um, they form the front line of disciplined armies across the Eastern Reach and are commonly found in cultures with an organized martial structure. They can also be encountered as wandering mercenaries, bodyguards, and other types of cell swords. The common element that unifies fighters is their heavy focus on endurance and melee defense. They start off with constant recovery, which allows them to regenerate endurance at a moderate, modest rate during combat, and they get bonuses to athletics, lore, and survival. Those are their basic stats. Monks belong to a variety of fighting orders that have sprung up in Ixmitil in the Eastern Reach over the past few centuries. While many monastic, or, monastic orders could trace their teachings to the enduring founder Tletek, individual organizations vary greatly in their focus, morality, and ethics. Common folk respect the incredible discipline of monks, but see them as an odd, unpredictable bunch who may not be entirely sane. Even mercenaries and other adventurers aren't sure what to make of them. The starting ability is Transcendent Suffering, which allows their unarmed attacks to do damage as they gain levels, and then um, as they are damaged, their pain generates wounds, which can be used to power many of their special abilities. Bonuses to Stealth, Athletics, Survival. These are guys. These guys are purely a DPS class, so... Looking at, say, the Barbarian being DPS, the Chanter being a, a support and and um, buff class with a little bit of DPS. Cypher is a DPS class. Um, the Druid is a uh, support DPS class. Fighter's straight up whatever you want it to be. A Monk is a DPS class. Paladin is somebody who could either be a main tank or an additional melee DPS slash support character. Paladins are martial zealots devoted to a god, a ruler, or even a way of life. They can be found in any culture where a fanatical group of like-minded individuals have formed a warrior society dedicated to advancing their cause. And among those aligned to their worldview, paladins are viewed with respect and admiration, if a bit of fear. Many paladins hold leadership positions in armies and mercenary companies, but in the heat of battle, their fanaticism often overrules the chain of command and common sense. They start off with faith and conviction, 
which is an inherent passive bonus to all their defenses. And over the course of the game, the value of this bonus may shift based on the reputations the paladins gain relative to the behaviors that are preferred by his or her order. Those are their bonuses. What that essentially means is that the Faith and Conviction is a passive bonus that you get. But over the course of the game, as you level up your character, you get a chance to shift what those bonuses may be depending on the options that you take as you level up your character through the, the chosen order that you've picked. Um, so it's just another way to add a little bit of additional flair to the character. Priests are your standard healers. Um, they do some DPS, um, but they are mostly going to be focused on uh, healing. Priests are devotees of Eros deities and practitioners of religious magic. And while all priests dedicate themselves to a specific god, their power is actually derived from their personal beliefs, not from their deity. That's an important component of this game. Uh, belief in a deity... I, I'm, I don't want to spoil anything from the story, but the deities in this game are a lot different than deities in other games. And so the belief in a deity is what gives a priest their power. And the more staunch their belief, uh, the more powerful their powers will be. B basically, the, the more of a zealot you are, the more powerful you're going to be. Priests tend to focus on philosophy, teaching, and the relationship of religious organizations with common folk. And the reception of priests in any given part of the world largely depends on how their god is revered or reviled by the people who live there. They start off with Holy Radiance, which is a modest amount of endurance regeneration for allies around the priest, and any enemy vessels caught in the area take burn damage and may be frightened. Now, this is much like the buff for the Paladin, because over the course of the game, the power of your uh, Holy Radiance is going to shift based on the reputation that you gain relative to the behaviors that are preferred by your deity. You also have access to your uh, support and offensive-oriented spells, and then every two levels, much like the Druid, you're going to get some additional spell sets, and it can eventually shift to per-encounter use with an Athletics and Lore bonus. Now, Rangers are... I'd say they're fairly standard if you've played any other CRPG. Um, you obviously have subsex, which we'll get into in a little bit with all the different classes, but they are your traditional woodlands master of the hunt. And they, in this game, a little different to other games, in this game, they are always partnered with an animal companion. So you're always going to have an animal companion, and you do get to choose from a handful of animals which have different things that they do for you. Um, their lifestyles often tend towards independence and isolation, so it's rare for them to become an internal, integral part of a large fighting force, though they can often be employed as um, scouts and guides. So here it gives a brief definition of your animal companion. Uh, your companion starts at, uh, fights at your command and is extremely valuable for your ability, for its ability to run interference. They don't necessarily do a lot of damage, but they have high damage reduction. Um, the link between the two is powerful, and if one goes down in battle, the other suffers as well. But here's what I will say, because the most recent playthrough I did was as a ranger main. I will say that you can make your you can make your animal companion extremely powerful through um, the leveling up process. So as you level up, you have the ability to choose. Um, not the ability to, but you, you get ability choices, which allow you to customize your character as you level up. Now, you can choose to put those points into making your character do more TPS or be more healthy or more resilient, or etc. Or you can choose to put those points into your animal companion and buff up the damage that your animal does, the amount of damage they can take, their hit points, their defenses, all these other things, their crit, crit ratings. So you can actually make your pet quite powerful and capable of handling tanking as long alongside any of your main uh, melee uh, characters in the game. The Rogue is up next, and Rogues, like many other games, can be uh, played in a variety of different ways. Um, this says here they're ferocious killers, <laughs> feared for the brutality of their attacks, um, often found in the dark back alleys as in the heart of battlefield skirmishes, unpredictable and undisciplined, they are commonly used as shock troops or as part of a surprise assault with their withering attacks, breaking enemy ranks, and more. These are a DPS class straight up. They tend to congregate in large numbers of cities where they can be steadily employed as mercenaries, and they start off with Sneak Attack, which applies bonus damage to their ranged and melee weapon attacks when the target has any of the following afflictions. Um, it also applies to any target the rogue strikes with the weapon within the first two seconds of combat. So sneak attack is really powerful, but the caveat I will say to this is that if you're going to be playing a melee version of a rogue, you're going to be doing a lot of micromanagement. 
um, because you'll need to get your um, positioning and stuff. Uh, but the ranged version, you get sneak attack damage as well. So you could prove you could, if you want less hands-on, you could do um, from there. And last but not least is the wizard. Now, wizards are slightly different in this game than other CRPGs because you do have to have your book or your grimoire, and the spells that you can cast are based upon the spells that you have in your grimoire. Um, you, you don't just have inherent spells; it's based on whatever's in your book. Now you can learn spells from other grimoires, so as you're playing the game and grimoires drop from enemies or you find grimoires that you can purchase out in the wild, you can actually memorize those spells, pull them out of someone else's book and put them into your own. Masters of academic magic, wizards are students of arcane traditions that stretch back beyond the boundaries of recorded history. Wizards are a highly organized group, often forming academies or guilds devoted to research and development in magical studies, and tend to favor environments where inquiry, and experimentation, debate, and the dissemination of knowledge are encouraged. Many accomplished wizards eventually become known for their eccentric, or their eccentricity, excuse me, and their egos, and their unquenchable interest in all things arcane. You start off with arcane assault, which is a mid-range attack that hits a small area for raw damage can leave targets dazed, and of course you have your spells. Now there's a lot of information here to let's dissect this wizards have access to a variety of offensive and personal defense spells now i would argue that wizards are primarily a dps class but they can become a variety of things depending on what you want your wizards to be because there are a lot of spells at your disposal so i like to play a dps wizard but you can play a buffing wizard and you can play like a control wizard where you're controlling the battlefield with like hold person days um confusion and spells of that nature Unlike priests and druids, wizards learn individual spells that they store in and cast relic from their grimoires, which I kind of explained. They can only hold four spells of each spell level, which motivates wizards to keep multiple grimoires for different needs. Every two levels, wizards gain access to an additional set of spells. However, they can automatically learn one spell of any that they can access each time they advance. Wizards also have the option of learning spells from grimoires they find or buy. Initially, per rest, but later on per encounter so that's the thing if you want to have a character that could do different things you just basically set up different grimoires so here's my fire grimoire here's my ice grimoire here's my control grimoire here's my whatever grimoire and you can have different grimoires in your inventory so there you have it folks that is a basic breakdown of the classes in pillars of eternity and all the options available to you if I had to pick something uh, for your first playthrough, I would honestly, because here's, here's what I usually do. My first playthrough is always going to be a rogue. And the reason for that is because I like to play a character that has the ability to disarm traps, open doors, and so on and so forth. My second playthrough is almost always a wizard, and I will follow that up with a ranger character. And if I go into a fourth playthrough, I will traditionally do either a fighter or or a paladin now there are a lot of different things you can play none of these are bad choices much like say Baldur's Gate or Dragon Age Origins you are going to have a party of adventurers who come with you so even if you play a paladin don't worry about it you will find a mage a rogue a healer and other people to come along with you in your journey and there are quite a few characters to choose from in this game various companions that you'll come across so don't worry about that too much most important thing is pick something that you like to play and go forth from there. You'll be able to specialize your character as you level up, just like you can in any other RPG. And from there, you can get all the cool weapons and armor that really help you define your character even more. If you liked all of this, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update as I play this game and other CRPGs, MMORPGs, RPGs, and beyond. And if you want to support, which hopefully you do, it keeps me on the air full time. I get to do this for a living because of the people who support the channel. The easiest way is with a membership. Here on YouTube, we have three different tiers. There's also memberships on our Patreon page. You can also do super chats and stickers during live streams and premieres or super thanks after the fact, which is where you can either choose your own amount to donate to a given video or you can just use some of the prearranged uh, numbers that are there and it's whatever you want to do two dollars five dollars fifty dollars five thousand dollars whatever you feel like you can contribute to the channel it's all great ways to support me so thanks to those of you who do hopefully you can and stick around we got a lot more coming down the pipeline thanks everybody for your time happy gaming see you in the next episode